right, so this morning we will be in Psalm 74, Psalm 74, and um, the title of the message this morning is A Plea for Help, A Plea for Help, Psalm um, 74, and if you all remember, um, the last time I was up here, we, uh, we went through Daniel chapter 1. And if you, if you remember, that was a time when the Lord had used um, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians um, to pour out his judgment upon Judah for her idolatry, for her unfaithfulness, and for her disobedience. And in fact, Jeremiah speaks of this in Jeremiah chapter um, 25, there beginning in the ninth verse. Now, remember the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar they took the Jewish people captive, and they destroyed the temple. And in fact, in 2 Kings chapter 25, beginning in verse 8, um, that particular event, those events are documented very well there for us. And if you remember from the last time, those events put Daniel and his friends in a very difficult situation. They had to choose between being defiled by this Babylonian king or remain faithful um, to the Lord. And fortunately, what we learned the last time in Daniel chapter 1 is that Daniel and his friends, they remained faithful to the Lord. They did not compromise. They didn't compromise, right? And as a result of that, they were greatly blessed and, um, and rewarded by the Lord. Well, today, as we go through Psalm 74 together, here, the psalmist, Asaph, he pens for us a lament, an expression of grief that looks back to that particular event, specifically the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. And this particular Asaph, who, who has written this, this psalm, is likely not the chief musician of King David's day. Um, the term Asaph, you can think of it almost like a family name, a family of musicians. So Asaph, who is written here, Psalm 74, is likely a descendant of the Asaph of King's David, King David's time, his particular uh, chief musician. Now, some scholars believe that Psalm 74 uh, really refers to the desecration of the temple by Antipas, but as we read through Psalm 74 this morning, what we will notice is that it speaks of the destruction of the temple, um, which actually took place when it was taken under siege by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. So this morning, I believe it's speaking of that particular time when um, the Babylonians came and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple and took many people um, captive because of their disobedience to the Lord, right? The Lord had poured out this judgment upon them. So even though the prophets had warned um, Judah of this coming judgment, for example, Ezra documents this for us in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, beginning in, in verse 15, um, the people of Judah still continued living in the state of idolatry and disobedience, even though they were being warned about this. They, they still disobeyed. And as you can imagine, the destruction of their temple was so catastrophic. It was so big. It was such an awful event that it really shook the faith of the people there in Jerusalem, there in the region of, um, of Judah. And I love how Pastor Chuck puts it. He puts it like this. He says, the picture is this. The city of Jerusalem is a waste. The temple has been destroyed right down to the foundation because when Zerubbabel began to rebuild the temple, he had to lay again the foundations of the temple. The city has been razed. The walls are destroyed. The Babylonians had carried the people away captive, and there is just a few people left amidst the rubble of the once glorious city of Jerusalem and the temple of God. So despite all of this chaos and destruction, um, there is beauty in this psalm that Asaph pens for us. You see, as we go through the psalm together, 
what we are going to notice is that Asaf goes from a place of great desperation to a place of confidence. And we know that God uses everything in our lives for our good. Nothing is wasted. It doesn't matter what season you're going through. It's all for a purpose. It's for the Lord's purpose. And Asaf brings us to this realization as we go through Psalm uh, 74 this morning together. So before we get into the Word of God uh, verse by verse, um, let me go ahead and open up in prayer, and then we'll read the psalm together, and then we'll, we'll look at this verse by verse. Well, Lord, once again, we thank you so much for this morning, Lord, for this privilege of coming here together to worship you, Lord, to seek your face, Lord. And, you know, Lord, sometimes we, we come here, Lord, with so much on our hearts, with so much on our minds, so much heaviness, Lord. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you would just help us to get the focus on you, Lord. Remove any obstacles, anything in the way, Lord God, of doing that. Because there are things that we can't control, Lord, only you can control. And we pray this morning that you fill this place, fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Speak to us through your word, Lord, because we've come here expectantly, desiring to hear from you, Lord. We know your presence is here. We thank you for your love and your compassion and your mercies, which are new every morning, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 74. I'm going to read the psalm here, and then we'll, we'll look at this verse by verse. So here, Asaph writes, Why have you rejected us forever, God? Why does your anger burn against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you purchased long ago and redeemed as a tribe for your own possession. Remember Mount Zion, where you dwell. Make your way to the perpetual ruins, to all that the enemy has destroyed in the sanctuary. Your adversaries roared in the meeting place where you met with us. They set up their emblems as signs. It was like men in a thicket of trees, wielding axes, then smashing all the carvings with hatchets and picks. They set your sanctuary on fire. They utterly desecrated the dwelling place of your name. They said in their hearts, let's oppress them relentlessly. They burned every place throughout the land where God met with us. There are no signs for us to see. There's no longer a prophet, and none of us knows how long this will last. God, how long will the enemy mock? Will the foe insult your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand? Stretch out your right hand and destroy them. God, my king, is from ancient times, performing saving acts on the earth. You divided the sea with your strength. You smashed the heads of the sea monsters in the water. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You fed him to the creatures of the desert. You opened up springs and streams. You dried up ever-flowing rivers. The day is yours, also the night. You established the moon and the sun. You set all the boundaries of the earth. You made summer and winter. Remember this, the enemy has mocked the Lord and a foolish people has insulted your name. Do not give to beasts the life of your dove. Do not forget the lives of your poor people forever. Consider the covenant for the Lord, for the dark places of the land rather, are full of violence. Do not let the oppressed turn away in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Rise up, God. Champion your cause. Remember the insults that fools bring against you all day long. Do not forget the clamor of your adversaries, the tumult of your opponents that goes up constantly. Amen. So this is a pretty heavy, pretty heavy psalm here. This plea for help, this cry for help here in Psalm 74 is as a soft documents this event that we're speaking of, um, that we, we spoke a little bit about last week there in Daniel chapter 1. So what we see here, the first thing we notice here is the destruction of the temple here in verses 1 through 11. So let me first look at verses 1 through 4. Here Asaf says, he says, Why have you rejected us forever, God? Why does your anger burn against the sheep of your pasture? He says, Remember your congregation which you purchased long ago and redeemed as a tribe for your own possession. Remember Mount Zion, where you dwell. Make your way to the perpetual ruins, 
to all that the enemy has destroyed in the sanctuary. Your adversaries roared in the meeting place where you met with us. They set up their emblems as signs. So the idea that the Lord has rejected them, that the Lord was angry with them, this is kind of an obvious conclusion to come to, um, especially with what the Babylonians had done to the city and what they had done to the temple there in, um, in Jerusalem. And as you can imagine, to see the emblems of the enemy, you know, think of like a flag nowadays, right? The emblem of the enemy, the sign of the enemy flying over there in Jerusalem was, it was probably a very difficult thing for the people of Judah to experience and also for a soft to, to take in, you know, as he's writing about this here in this um, particular lament, this psalm. And then notice he's like, please don't forget us, right? How long was this desolation going to last? How long was this terrible thing going to last? And, you know, no matter how bad things look, we have to remember, we have to look back to God's promises um, in his word. And in fact, if you look in the book of Deuteronomy, there in chapter 4, verses 29 through 31, you know, the Lord has made a specific promise here to his people. There we read, But from there you will search for the Lord your God, and you will find him when you seek him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, in the future you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. He will not leave you, destroy you, or forget the covenant with your ancestors that he swore to them by oath. Because the Lord your God is a compassionate God. You see, the Lord has promised not to abandon his people. And he has promised not to abandon us as well. This is not just unique to the people of Judah in that time. This is unique to all of us, even now in Christ Jesus, right? And, you know, when things look bleak, when things look hopeless, um, we have to remember that we are part of his precious flock, right? Psalm chapter 77, verse 20 tells us this. And because we're part of his precious flock, um, he will never abandon us. You know, this is the Lord. This was, this is the individual that redeemed the people of Judah, right? He had brought them out of Egypt, right? They were part of his inheritance. In fact, the book of Exodus speaks of this. There in chapter 19 and in chapter 34, for example. And, you know, when, we, when you think about the people of Judah, you see, these people thought that the presence of the temple um, was kind of like their security blanket, okay? And it was kind of like their guarantee. So regardless of how they lived, they still had this guarantee in a sense, and they thought they could just live however they wanted to. And I think as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, sometimes we live like that. We say to ourselves, you know, in those moments of weakness, that, you know, yeah, I'm in the Lord. The Lord loves me. You know, he will never leave me nor forsake me. Um, but we still continue to live in our sinful ways. We continue to live in the ways that um, do not honor the Lord. And the truth of the matter is, when we have invited the Lord into our lives, the power in the person of the Holy Spirit should change our hearts, and there should be a change in our lives. There should be a difference in our lives. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to be sinless, but we should have that heart to desire to sin less, right? And the people of Judah, you know, as, we, as we've read, as I've already mentioned, they were, they were engaging in idolatry against the Lord. They were unfaithful to the Lord. Um, they were living in a way that didn't honor the Lord, and he was pouring out his judgment upon them. And, um, and we need to be careful as we walk with the Lord, um, even today. We need to make sure that um, we are crucifying our flesh daily and allowing the Lord to move in our lives and to, to allow the Holy Spirit to change us. Now, um, if you remember there in Second Chronicles chapter 36, there Ezra, beginning in verse 15, there he speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, this very time that we're reading about here in this particular psalm, um, time and time again, um, they had been warned about their ways of living, their idolatry, and their unfaithfulness to the Lord. And in fact, if you look in Second Chronicles chapter 36, Ezra documents for us, it says, But the Lord 
the God of their ancestors sent word against them by the hand of his messengers, sending them time and time again, for he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept ridiculing God's messengers, the prophets, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that there was no remedy. So he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, they're speaking of King Nebuchadnezzar, who killed their fit young men with the sword and in the house of their sanctuary. He had no pity on young men or young women, elderly or aged. He handed them all over to him. He took everything to Babylon, all the articles of God's temple, large and small, the treasures of the Lord's temple, and the treasures of the king and his officials. Then the Chaldeans burned God's temple. They tore down Jerusalem's wall, burned all its palaces, and destroyed all its valuable articles. He deported those who escaped from the sword to Babylon, and they became servants to him and his sons until the rise of the Persian king kingdom. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, and the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the days of the desolation until 70 years were fulfilled. So they were told time and time again of this judgment to come because of their disobedience. And they still didn't change. And um, when you think about that in our lives, you know, there, there are going to be opportunities where we're going to be able to share the gospel with people around us. Now, if they don't accept the gospel, they reject it. It's not you that they are rejecting, okay? It's the Lord God that they are rejecting. And what we have to do is we have to keep praying for our loved ones, for our friends. Um, as we preach the gospel, as we share the message that saves and the fact that there is a judgment that will be coming, we want to make sure all of our loved ones are in Christ Jesus. And um, once again, if they reject the, the message, it's the Lord they're rejecting, it's not you. And we have to keep praying for them. Our loved ones, our friends, our family, because they can run, they can try to run from the church, they can try to run from God, but they can't run from our prayers. So we must keep praying for, for those individuals. And then what we want to notice here in the next few verses, beginning in verse 5 all the way to verse 8, what we're going to see here, read about rather, is the devastation, the destruction of the temple and, um, and the sanctuary. So beginning in verse 5, it says, It was like men in the thicket of trees, wielding axes, then smashing all the carvings with hatchets and picks. They set your sanctuary on fire. They utterly desecrated the dwelling place of your name. They said in their hearts, let's oppress them relentlessly. They burned every place throughout the land where God met with us. That's a pretty heavy section here. Um, and, and as you can imagine, this was, this was heartbreaking, right? If you look in the book of Exodus, for example, in, in, verse 20, in, in chapter 29, um, this was a place where God met with his people. This was the temple. This is where the, um, the altar was for the sacrifices. They needed the Lord now with all of this that was happening. But where was the Lord? Where was he? Um, according to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, Israel had not honored God's name, and they had actually turned the temple into a den of thieves. And as believers, there are going to be seasons in our life where we're going we're gonna to be devastated, we're going to be completely heartbroken, and we're going to wonder, where are you, Lord, right? Um, I don't feel your presence. And maybe, maybe you're going through a season like that right now, where you're so devastated, you are heartbroken, just like a soft, just like the people of Judah were in that time. And you're wondering where God is. Well, I can assure you that he is here. He's in your midst. He's in the details, just like he was in that time there in Judah. They should have just listened, right? They should have listened to those warnings. But notice in verse 5, these, these ruthless individuals, these, these Babylonians under um, King Nebuchadnezzar, they were literally swinging axes left and right, and they were smashing all the carvings um, there in the temple. They were destroying everything. Verse 6 tells us, um, it says, Then smashing all the carvings with hatchets and picks, 
And when you think about the Temple of Solomon, right, that particular temple that was destroyed, what we're speaking of right now, that was a place that was filled with beautiful carvings and ornamentation. And if you could imagine seeing all of that being destroyed. And um, I don't know if you all watch those shows on TV where they, um, they do like makeovers on homes. And there's always a person in the house with a sledgehammer and they're, they're destroying all the cabinets and all the, all the, you know, everything that's in the house are destroying it to, to make way for something new. And um, for many people that have lived in homes for, for so many years, there's so much value in those things, right? It, it's, it's valuable to them. There's great memories. And, and to have someone come in with a sledgehammer and just utterly destroy everything can be difficult. It can be heartbreaking. And in this case, obviously, the sanctuary was so meaningful to the people of Judah. And to see these individuals come in here and completely destroy everything was extremely difficult for them to take, as you could imagine. And then to add insult to injury, there in verse 7, it tells us that they actually set the sanctuary on fire. They utterly desecrated the dwelling place of your name. Is, is what the word of God says here, as Asaph has document, documented for us. So, not only that they destroy everything, they actually set the place on fire. It was brought down to its foundation. And in fact, um, if you look in the book of Ezra, okay, there it tells us that later uh, uh, Zerubbabel had to rebuild the temple, right? First he rebuilt the altar, but then he had to relay the foundation, right? And that's because of this total destruction that took place um, because of the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you notice also in verse 8, this is actually very distressing. It says, they said in their hearts, they're speaking of the Babylonians, let's oppress them relentlessly, right? And then they burned every place throughout the land where God met with them or with us is what it says there. So, you know, these, these Babylonians, they were relentless, they wanted to make this an utterly devastating event. And when you think about King Nebuchadnezzar, this was a ruthless ruler. This was an individual that, you know, he made things very difficult for people if they didn't go along with him. He took the best of everyone else and brought it onto himself. We talked a little bit about that the last time when we went through Daniel chapter 1. But um, this was a devastating situation. Um, and notice in verse 9, Asaf says, there are no signs for us to see. There's no longer a prophet. And none of us knows how long this will last. You know, this was a, an awful situation, right? And it can be summed up with the following three points. Number one, there were no signs in the midst of all that chaos, right? The, the miraculous intervention of the Lord, which they had experienced in the past, was not present at that time. It also says that there were no prophets. Number two, the prophetic voice was silent at this time. They had ignored the prophetic voice, right? At the, at the beginning, had they listened, they could have avoided all of this. Um, and then thirdly, there was no hope. Nobody knew how long this misery was going to last. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of anxiety, as you can imagine, a lot of stress, a lot of um, um, desperation. And... As we've mentioned before, we've, we've all been through seasons like that, where we don't think the Lord is present, that he's silent, he's deserted us. But I assure you, he's there, the Lord is there, he's with you, he's in the midst of everything. He's in the chaos. Because remember, in this time, the Lord was with Daniel and his friends, as we read the last time, right? He was there with them as they went through this circumstance, right? As Nebuchadnezzar had taken them um, captive, right, and tried to defile them, but the Lord was with them. And because of that, they found favor, right, with that chief eunuch. And they were able to avoid compromising and, um, and defiling themselves for the Lord's sake. And then notice in verse 10 and in verse 11, they are left with three questions regarding what's happening. Uh, number one, they say, God, how long will the enemy mock? Number two, will the foe insult your name forever? And then thirdly, why do you hold back your hand? Right? And then, then Asaf says, stretch out your right hand and destroy them. Okay, so you have these questions that are remaining. And, and sometimes we question the Lord too in our difficult times. We're like, God, where are you? Why aren't you doing something? Like, why are you just standing there, Lord? And the truth is the Lord is doing what he's doing. And we, we, can't, 
we can't make things happen in our own timing. We can't fix things. Only the Lord can do that. It'll drive you crazy if you try to do that. I've been there many times. We have to let the Lord do what he's doing and remain steadfast in the circumstance. I know that that is something that is easier said than done because, um, because we're in the flesh. We're humans. We want, we, want to be, we want resolution right away. And the Lord's timing is perfect. And he will bring that resolution when he desires because he knows what's best for us. Um, and in this case, these people were devastated. They were desperate. They needed the Lord. And they believed that they were deserted. They believed that the Lord, like the Lord was over here, like he had no idea what was happening. And sometimes we believe that too. Like we're going through our season and we think God's over there. He doesn't see what's happening, but he knows. He knows everything. He knows what's going on. Um, but as you can imagine, these individuals felt, they felt terrible. However, as we move into the next section of the psalm, what we're going to see, what we're going to read about are, are some beautiful reminders of our, of our Lord, right? Some truths regarding the Lord. And in this psalm, in a sense, it takes a, a turn for the better. So the second thing we're going to look at is that the Lord reigns. Okay, this is verses 12 through 17. So here Asaph writes, he says, God, my king, is from ancient times, performing saving acts on the earth. You divided the sea with your strength. You smashed the heads of the sea monsters in the water. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You fed him to the creatures of the desert. You opened your springs and streams. You dried up ever-flowing rivers. The day is yours, also the night. You established the moon and the sun. You set all the boundaries of the earth. You made summer and, and winter. Now, reading this, you know, this is, this is a, beautiful, a beautiful turning point, I believe, in this psalm. And, and reading these verses is, is very comforting because it reminds us of the Lord's power, of the Lord's love, and the Lord's compassion. These verses here, they're filled with the Lord's salvation works. And these salvation works, what the Lord's capable of doing, saving these individuals numerous times, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second, they're not just unique to the people of Judah in that time, but they're also unique to us as believers, as God's people, right? The Lord has performed many things in our lives, and he will continue to do that. And notice here that verse 13, right, it talks about him dividing the sea with his strength and smashing the heads of the sea monsters. If you remember, right, um, the Lord parted the Red Sea, right, to, to deliver the children of Israel um, out of Egypt, right? And if you remember um, there, he, he destroyed the army of, of Pharaoh as well as Pharaoh in, in the process. And the sea monsters there could be interpreted as, as, um, as the, uh, the army there of, of King Pharaoh and the Egyptian, right? Um, but the Lord saved them. He, he parted the Red Sea. And there's, there, is, there is something that is miraculous that now Asaph is reflecting on. Um, verses 14 through 17, notice that it speaks of um, the Lord's power manifested in nature. And we know that the Lord is the creator of all, whether it's creatures or the earth itself, everything around us, the planets and space. And, you know, this is something that we've been talking a lot about in the book of Genesis um, in, our, in our men's study. And I love what Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 32, verse 17. He says, Oh, Lord God. You yourself made the heavens and earth by your great power and with your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. And I love that because nothing is too difficult for the Lord. And we see this here with these salvation works that we've just read about. And I want us to, to think about this for a little bit. Take a minute and think about all that the Lord has done. All that the Lord has done in your life in the lives of your loved ones, all that the Lord has rescued you from, all that the Lord has rescued your family from, and, you know, all the things that he is still going to rescue us from. And when you think about those things, it really humbles you. Now, if you're in a season right now where maybe you're struggling financially, maybe your marriage is falling apart, um, maybe you have no hope, maybe you need a healing of your body, a physical healing for your health. Remember all that God has done for you in the past. Remember what the Lord has done for your loved ones in the past and hold fast to what he will do for you in the future. 
because he's promised so much for us through his word. And we believe his word is truth. He's going to hold to his word as he has already. So there's more to come. And just as Asaph does here, in his current circumstance, this, this awful situation that they're going through, he turns to the Lord. He looks to the Lord. And that's what we need to do. And, you know, this is something that Pastor Angel talked a little bit about last week, right? We need to turn to the Lord and not to the circumstance or the difficulty. Once again, that's something that's easier said than done, but it's doable in Christ Jesus. We just have to tap in to what the Lord has provided for us through the power and the person of his Holy Spirit, his word, prayer, and our brothers and sisters in Christ that we can lean on in fellowship with. And, you know, it's interesting because when you look at Psalm 73, which is the psalm just before this, Asaph has like a similar experience as he has in this psalm so far. And in fact, I encourage you all to read Psalm 73 um, for homework. Um, Psalm 73, once again, is, is the one right before this. But there in Psalm 73, um, Asaph believes in his mind that the wicked are prospering. And he actually begins to question his own faith and his own walk. He's like, you know, why am I wasting my time faithfully serving the Lord when all these wicked people are, are prospering, right? That's like the perfect place where the enemy wants us to be, right? Where we're isolated and he's messing with our minds, we're questioning our faith. You know, Saf was completely deceived. But if, if you look in the Psalm, it says that it wasn't until he went into the sanctuary of the Lord or God, um, right? He physically went into the temple that he realized how foolish he was. He took his eyes off of what he was seeing and put his eyes back on the Lord. And he realized that these wicked people were truly in slippery places. And in verse 26 of Psalm 73, he says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. And we need to turn to the Lord. We need to look to God, just like Asaf did in Psalm 73. And just as he does that here in Psalm 74. He realizes that there was still hope. There was still a future, right? All had not been lost. Psalm 121 verses 1 through 2 tells us, I lift my eyes towards the mountains. You can think of that as the obstacle, the difficulty. Where will my help come from? It says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's where our help's going to come from. It's not going to come from anyone else or anything else. And Asaf, reflecting on those salvation works, was able to realize that and look to the Lord. Now, there's a, there's a beautiful musical piece. It, it's a choral piece. Um, it's also been written for, um, for band um, ensembles and for string ensembles. It's called Salvation is Created. Um, I actually had the privilege to, to play this piece um, when I was in college. I used to play the trombone. I was in, a, in, a, in the band there. And we played this piece called Salvation is Created. This piece was composed um, by a Russian composer. His name is Pavel Chesnikov. He, he composed it in 1912. And this was actually a piece of music that was inspired by the verses that we just read here in Psalm 74. These salvation works verses, if you want to call them that. Um, unfortunately for Chesnikov, um, this was a piece of music he never got to hear because he was forced into um, secular music by the Soviet Union as they were suppressing, suppressing Christianity at that time. So he never got to hear it. His kids got to hear it. But when you hear Salvation is Created, and I encourage you to look that, look that up maybe later as well, um, when you listen to this piece of music, and the way I would describe it to you is just this beautiful, warm piece of music. It takes you to a place where, in my opinion, you have a lot of peace, a lot of, of solace, and you're, you're just, you're in this place where everything that you were dealing with is, is gone. And, and um, in reading this and in, in remembering what this music sounds like, and when you turn to the Lord, when you remember the things he's done for you, when you remember the things that he's promised to do for you, it takes you to a place where you have peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't matter what season you're going through. And one of the, one of the lyrics to Salvation is Created, um, it goes like this. It says, Salvation is created in the midst of the earth. O oh God, O oh our God, hallelujah. And what a mighty God, right? What a mighty King. When times seem hopeless, all we have to do is look up to the Lord. 
because the best is yet to come in Christ Jesus. And this is exactly what Asaf did here. And now he was confident and he could move forward. All was not lost. And we too, we need to continue moving forward. Moving forward in that race that we're running um, together as brothers and sisters in Christ uh, for the Lord's sake. But the only way we can do that is keep looking to, look, keep looking to the Lord because we're going to fall many times in this race. I have fallen many, many times. I mean, if you could physically see it, I'd be full of bruises and scrapes. Um, but you got to keep going. You got to get up and keep going. And remember what the Lord has done for you um, because he's cheering you on, as we learned last week, right? As well as many saints before us who have finished the race, they're cheering us on. And that's a beautiful thing. Now, the last thing we're going to read here in the psalm, you know, Asaf began with great despair. And then now he has a little bit more confidence because he's reflected on what the Lord's done for him. And he's now looking to the Lord. What we're going to see here in this third part is that we are not forgotten. We're not forgotten. And this is verses 18 through 23. So let me first read um, verse 18 through 21. It says here, Remember this. The enemy has mocked the Lord, and a foolish people has insulted your name. Do not give to beasts the life of your dove. Do not forget the lives of your poor people forever. Consider the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of violence. Do not let the oppressed turn away in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. So if you look in verse 18 and 19, it's very interesting here because Asaf reminds God that he too, you know, he's the Lord, but he's also involved in this disaster, right? He's the one who's being mocked and being insulted by the Babylonians. But just as the Babylonians had, um, you know, they, they had done this to, to Judah, right? They had mocked and insulted Judah. The people of Judah had mocked and insulted the Lord as well. Because I had ignored the warnings of the prophets regarding this disaster that was coming because of their idolatry and because of their disobedience. And in the midst of all this, Asaf is still crying out, like, please don't forget us, Lord. You know, Asaf saw a nation, right, this nation of Judah, as this defenseless dove with no way of escape. Had they just listened to the prophets, this could have all been avoided. And I think in many ways we can relate to Asaf um, and, and how he felt for the nation of Judah. You know, particularly when it comes to our own nation and the state of our country right now. Um, you, you think about the nation right now, just the unrighteousness, the sin. We're living in the days of Noah again, is, is what it seems like. Um, and sometimes we feel like God has forgotten us um, and he's not listening to our prayers. But it's not true. And just as Asaf is crying out here for Judah, this defenseless dove to the Lord, we too need to be crying out for our nation, for our city, for our world, right? In addition to all of our loved ones, all the people in our lives. And I remember someone telling me once that, like, we can run from the church, we can run from God, we can try to, right? But we can't run from people's prayers. So that's why we have to keep praying for everything, for people, for our country, for our leaders. Um, just like Asaph is here, he's interceding for the nation of, of, of Judah in this lament to the Lord, this cry, this plea to the Lord. Because only God can help us. And when you think about our nation in particular, it's not a man or a woman in leadership that's going to help us. It's not any type of movement or any type of affiliation, but rather it's the Lord who's going to help us. And that's why we as believers need to point people to Jesus and not to a movement, not to um, a political party or anything like that. That's only temporary. The only political party we want is a theocracy. And that's when the Lord is ruling on this planet. Um, and we're not there yet, right? But that's something we can look forward to in the future. Because it's in his word and he's promised it. Now, if you look in verse 20 and 21, um, notice here that Asaph then turns to God's covenant with Israel. And there, of course, he's referring to the Old Covenant. And if you look in the book of Leviticus, for example, um, chapter 26, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 through 30, um, for example, there it speaks of this, um, of the Old Covenant, if you want to refresh yourself on that. And he knew the terms of the covenant. If Israel obeyed the Lord, he would bless them. If, he if, if they disobeyed, rather, he would chasten them. If they confessed their sins, he would forgive them. 
And of course, now we know that we're not living under the old covenant. We're living under the new covenant in Christ Jesus. But we have the same promises. Now, the Lord did not forget about his covenant. Um, he was chastening his people because of their disobedience and their idolatry. And through this event of judgment that he was pouring upon Judah, it was all because of the covenant he had made for them. Remember what the Proverbs tell us in Proverbs 3 verse 12. It says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. And we know that it hurts when we are chastened. We know it hurts when we are disciplined. But God does it because he loves us. If our earthly fathers disciplined us because they loved us, and I can tell you, my dad had to discipline me many, many times. And it hurt. It was a disappointment. I never wanted to disappoint my dad because I loved him. It was a healthy fear I had of my father. And my dad expected the best. And um, unfortunately, he had to discipline me. And it's because he loved me. But how much more so will our heavenly father discipline us? He loves us more than our earthly fathers could possibly love us. And he's going to do that. He's going to discipline us. And that's what he's doing here. He didn't forget about them. He didn't forget about the covenant. He was disciplining them. In verse 22 and verse 23, he closes and he says, Rise up, God. Champion your cause. Remember the insults that fools bring against you all day long. Do not forget the clamor of your adversaries, the tumult of your opponents that goes up constantly. So Asaph is calling out to God. We're going to be wiped out, right? God, your, your, your cause is at stake here. You must defend the honor of your name because the enemy is mocking you daily. You know, the nation has been ravaged, right? The city has been destroyed. The temple has been destroyed by these wicked people. It's been completely destroyed, wrecked. And despite all of this chaos, the essentials were not touched. They were not destroyed. And those essentials are the fact that they still belonged to the Lord. Also, his covenant and his word had not been changed. And God was working through all of, of this, all that they were going through. You know, even when you think about our world today with all the despair, even in our own personal lives, the things that are agonizing to us, the Lord's working in everything. And, and just as a soft, we need to keep looking to him because that's the only way we can get through this. So in closing this morning, there were three things that we learned from Psalm 74 that Asaph has taught us. Number one, we saw that the way that Asaph began the psalm was one that was of great despair. It was apparent that after the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar had finished destroying the city and the temple, that it felt like God had forsaken them, that the Lord had deserted them once and for all. The second thing we learned that it wasn't until Asaph turned his eyes or took his eyes off of that horrible circumstance and put them back on the Lord that he realized that they were still the sheep of his pasture. They were still his congregation. They were still the tribe of his inheritance. Okay, it wasn't until he looked to, Lord, to the Lord until he realized that. And, and we read those beautiful salvation works verses there beginning in verse 12. He went from a state of despair to a state of confidence but only because he looked to the Lord. And he remembered all that the Lord had done for his people, people that had left their first love in a sense, but they could still come back to their first love. And sometimes we do that, right? We go through times in our lives where we leave our first love, which is the Lord, but we can always come back to him. Um, he, he's waiting for us and he's desiring to see us again. Thirdly, Asaf remembers the covenant that the Lord had made with them a covenant that the Lord was abiding to as he was chastening and correcting a nation of people that he loved so dearly. Now, when you and I go through seasons of desolation, seasons of hopelessness, seasons where you think God is absent, nowhere to be found, where, whether you got there out of disobedience or whether you got there um, because the Lord has allowed this into your life as you're walking with him, we have to remember what Asaph has shown us here. Number one, once again, you still belong to the Lord, okay? He's not left you. He has not forsaken you. We have to remember that nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. Even in those seasons of chastening and correction, when we are disobedient, nothing can separate us. 
Remember the believer's triumph in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Here Paul reminds us, he says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave up, gave up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what a beautiful reminder. We will always belong to the Lord regardless. And, and that's, that's wonderful. There will always be someone in our lives that loves us. And that's the Lord first and foremost, right? He'll, he'll love us like no one else can possibly love us. So let's forget that we still belong to the Lord, even when we go through seasons like Asaph has gone through um, in this particular event. Secondly, just like Asaph, we need to keep our eyes on the Lord and not on the circumstance, right? Colossians 3, 2 tells us to set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Isaiah 26, verse 3 tells us, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The third thing we learn from Asaph, and as you go through a difficult season, a difficult time, is that the Lord hasn't forgotten us. He will never forget us. He will never forget the promises that he has made through his word and through his son, Jesus. We're so valuable to him, even in those seasons of chastening and correction, because if he didn't care, he wouldn't have corrected us, right? And in fact, we're so valuable to him and so uniquely made that the probability of another person existing exactly like you is one in 400 trillion. That's a four with 14 zeros behind it. That's a very low possibility. Um, we're so unique and so valuable to him. He will never forget us. Psalm 139, 13 tells us, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Job 10, verse 8, the first part of verse 8 tells us, Your hands shaped me and formed me. We're so valuable to him from the beginning since he created us. So how could he forget about us? He'll never forget us. 1 John 4, 9 through 10 tells us God's love was, was revealed among us. In this way, God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be atoned, uh, to be the atoning sacrifice rather for our sins. And there's no greater love than that. Charles Spurgeon once said, Hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity and only to be discovered in the night of adversity. So as we run this race together as brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever seasons we go through together, let's keep looking to the Lord. Let's keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. Amen. If you are joining us um, via the live stream, and um, even here in person, and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and maybe you're in a season of desolation right now, a season of hopelessness, a season where like, you don't even know what to do anymore. You want a hope, you want a future, and you want to declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning. We want to give you that opportunity. Um, if that's you, we're going we're gonna to close our eyes, we're going to bow our heads, and uh, we're going to say a prayer. And I, I ask that you say this with me wholeheartedly. Um, to declare the Lord as, to declare Jesus Christ rather as your Lord and Savior. So this morning, Lord, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And um, we pray, Lord, for, for people's hearts this morning, maybe those that are seeking, desiring to declare your son Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Lord. And if that's you this morning, repeat this after me with your whole heart. Jesus Christ, um, I believe that you are the Son of God, 
I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I know that I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, use me for your glory, beginning now and forever. Amen. If you prayed that, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. Um, as always, there's a celebration going on in heaven um, for those that give their lives to the Lord. And right now there's a celebration going on on your behalf. And if you have any, any other questions, any further instructions you, you need, anything like that, please reach out to the church. If you need a Bible, um, you need prayer, anything, please just reach out. Or you can meet with us. Here we meet on, on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We have our men's study at 6.30 on Wednesdays. However, we're going we're gonna to postpone that until next week for the men's study. But we will be here next Sunday at 10 a.m. We meet at our buildings at the corner of, of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. And um, we just we want to be here for you, whatever your need is. And um, we thank you so much for taking the time this morning to worship the Lord with us. Um, we love you and we're praying for you. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. And, um, and we pray that you, you, you have a blessed week. Uh, well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for this time, Lord, for your love, for your compassion, for what we learn through your word, Lord. And when we find ourselves in those seasons of just utter despair and, and hopelessness, Lord, um, let us remember, Lord, the things that you've done for us and the things that you've promised to do for us. We thank you so much for loving us, Lord God, for, for never deserting us, Lord. We will belong to you forever. And we thank you for that, Lord. There's so much to, to triumph in. There's so much to be joyful about, Lord. And, and we pray this morning, Lord, that you help us to get through this week, whatever we're going to face, Lord. We don't know, but you know. And we can face that with the confidence that we have in you and your son, Jesus, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord. And this morning, we also want to lift up our, our pastor, Pastor Angel, in, in prayer, Lord, and his family, that you would bring them back safely to El Paso. You would just grant them traveling grace. We pray you continue to move in his life. And we pray for everyone here. Continue to move in everyone's lives, Lord God. Those that are watching, we thank you so much, Lord, for this privilege of just knowing you and loving you, Lord. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen.